Look, I, I see a lot of people in the industry having a life. Uh, people in the industry, they've decided, look, uh, whether they run on set menus, whether they run on less days a week. I think people have said, let's run our business. We can make it profitable in you know less shifts, less services a week, and we can have days off and we can have a life. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Over the last year, we've documented the impact that the pandemic has had on those applying their trade in the food industry. We've heard heartache, success stories, closures, new openings, and legends that have left an indelible mark on our culinary landscape, but even with years of experience, found themselves trying to find their feet after the rug was pulled out from under them. How does one reflect on the way things were and the new world of hospitality emerging. Russell Blakey is the former owner of Must Wine Bar in Western Australia. Russell, how are you? Great, Anthony. How are you? Good. You are, you're the heartbeat of the industry over there. You've been around for a couple of decades and had an amazing influence. Um, but yes. you let go of Must uh, fairly recently what, what was it like that period of time letting go of something that you'd be, had been part of you for so long so I, was, I was doing a radio gig yesterday with, with a mate of mine russell wolf and he said oh it's 102 days <laughs> and i kind of said 102 days what and he said since you close <laughs> uh, and i i wasn't i wasn't measuring the days actually because i've been having a great time um but look um it's it, 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 uh, we, we couldn't, it's really weird because um, COVID presented, and, and this is terrible to say this, but COVID presented one of the great years for us in Perth um, because we're able to, you know, even though we went into that terrible shutdown and the stress around it, um, mm. once we came out of it, it was incredibly busy. Um, and then on top of that, when we announced at the end of our lease we were closing and I wasn't going to renew into another 10-year lease, uh, we took 3,000 bookings in wow. a week. In a week. And it was just a melee. And, and the business was like we'd never seen it in, in, in the 19 years of operation before that. Um, and that, that was lovely because it was, it was a response, I think, to, to how people felt about must and, and what it meant to them. Mm. Um, there, there were so many stories from people who had weddings with us, who'd had their first date, who'd, um, you know, occasionally, I don't know what they were doing in the toilets, but occasionally there was something happening <laughs> in the toilets that, that was a bit of fun. Um, but seriously, must was this, um, you kind of re- you reflect on it when people come up to you and just grab you and say, look, this is, I've, I've had, I'm having a last dinner here because this is what we did. This is where we met. This is um, where we consummated a business relationship. This is where we did, you know, all these sorts of things. And mm. it meant so many different things to so many different people. It was, it was really good. The, however, the, the difficulty when you wind back to the shutdown in March, um, I, 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 I don't think in 19 years I've, I've been as stressed. Mm. Um, it's, we, we were doing lots of things, so, so I, I think we probably had a bit of a leg up um, in the sense that I was running a catering business out of must as well. Mm. I, had some, I had packaging. I knew where to get it from. I knew all of those things. So, in fact, two days before the shutdown, we were running our takeout operation. Um, wow. And that was just – I've always been a bit of a front foot person, and um, I thought this is where this is all going to shit. Um, we've got to. I, I hate the word pivot because pivot thinks you did it quickly and easily. It, it, it was it was um, dragging a, a, a ten story building crane. It wasn't a pivot, um, but changing so quickly and getting everyone on board, all the whole crew on board, to say, "Look, we're doing this." Um, and two days later, the place was shut. And we immediately jumped into a takeout business, and and most importantly to me, um, I kept ten staff employed during that. I, I had kitchen hands driving stuff. I had my manager running the order process. We set up an online ordering system pretty quickly. Um, we had um, yeah you know, some of the, the wait 
the, the girls who were waiting on the floor, a couple of them weren't on, couldn't get JobKeeper. So we said, okay, you've got a job, you've got a job, and we'll, we'll find a way to make it work for you. Um, so we kept 10 people employed in all sorts of ways. And we, our food sales went up. <laughs> our, our food sales went up. It's like, what? And it's like the people have come in, they're taking the pick up, pick up, they're picking up the takeout order. So, you know, they're saying to the, the team or me, if I'm out the front, you got this, you got, we got this, you got this, we're going to support you. And I think so many people in HOSPO just felt that overwhelming support of their customers as we did during that period. And it was just, you, you just felt it. It was tangible. You could feel people walking up um, and we, we, we had our pickup. Uh, we opened our front windows and we had a bench in the front window. So nobody came inside the business. Mm-hmm. And you're looking out to Beaufort street, which is one of the busiest streets in Perth, 50,000, 60,000 cars a day. It's empty, no cars. And these people are coming up, they're grabbing their takeout um, and they're just so happy about it. And it's just, it was just, it was so surreal. It was so surreal. And I think the way I explain it is I'm a business, I'm a chef and I'm a business person. And for 18 years, I felt I had total control of my business. I I knew what I was doing when times were tough, I could implement something within the business to make it happen or change it. But when COVID hit, I felt I had no control whatsoever of of what was going to happen in the world around us. And that caused that level of anxiety and stress. And and it was tough. But look, once we settled into the takeout and it just went off like a frog in a sock, (laughs) um, it it just – it was just, everyone just so happy in the team and we were able to keep most of the team on or not most of the team but a lot of the team stayed on um, and so when we came out of it we had our core team ready to roll which is great WA shut itself off from the rest of Australia and, and put in some pretty heavy restrictions on anyone coming in and they still continue um, but you mentioned the boom that's happened well, what, what has the trade period been like without uh, an influx of tourists, but a real boom from locals. As, as an operator that's been around for a while, paint, paint a picture for the last, of the last. Look, I'd, I'd, I'd put the current boom in hospitality around, you know, the 2008, 2009 kind of economic boom um, because of the um, – cap- everyone's captured in Western Australia. Um, everyone is – there is a lot of money rumbling around in the economy and it's not just in hospitality. So, you know, uh, fancy houses on the beach in Dunsborough, they're going for half a million over their asking price. You know, people are saying, well, look, I'm not going to go to Italy or I'm not going to go here and for this holiday. I'm staying here, so um, I've got this cash. What am I going to do with it? And, and that money's rumbling around in the economy. Mm-hmm. And likewise, um, in hospitality, um, people want a really good experience and- but we took that opportunity to review the business and we didn't want to open the same business that we closed. So we put in bonquette seating, made it more comfortable to spread people out in the bistro, took a big wine rack out, made the place fresher and more open and um, repainted the front of it. it really just, just tidied it up. Um, and, 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 it was really funny because you know when you people noticed that they really noticed the freshness and the open air nature of the bistro and and what we did because I, in the past I've spent you know like fifty thousand dollars refitting the bistro and repainting and putting sound paneling in and whatever and I'd gone downstairs and chatted to regular customers and said you know what do you think and they go what do you think of what <laughs> and and you kind of go oh. Uh, and you've kind of pointed and you just kind of wave off, wave them off and go, yeah, that's great. It's okay. <laughs> um, sometimes you realize, anyway, it, it just goes back to, um, we went back to the point of, of thinking about what's important in must, what's, what, what is really important, what's important to customers and what's important to running the business and what's not. And we got, the trimmers out and we cut away everything that we didn't think was important and we just kept the things that were. We obviously, we went to a set menu for a period of time, um, reduced food wastage, um, changed it a bit every week. We'd had to take the takeout component out because we couldn't cope with takeout and and the other cart, uh, the, the, the dining. And it, it just was 
uh, with, we're open four days a week, not five. So that gave the, the kitchen team, you know, an early night and then four solid, f- four solid nights. Um, it just gave everyone a breath and it, and it gave us a step back and, and a way to revise how to run a new business in the must in, in the COVID regime. And it was, it was just really refreshing. It was, it was like wonderful. And the best thing about it, um, with any hospitality business is that I was able to retain really the core of my team and um, on the floor, core team was there. Pablo was running the crew. They were just terrific. And on top of all this, Anthony, I chose May last year to have a shoulder reconstruction because I'm, I'm a bit of a surfer. And in 2016, I was mucking around with my mates at Scarborough, jumped off my surfboard and landed square on my shoulder on a sandbank and just ripped my shoulder apart. I'd, I'd been living for that with that for, for almost four years. Pain just got too much. And the surgeon just said, look, when, when you're ready, let me know. And I, I thought, look, let's give it a go. Um, and I... I I had Masato, my sous chef in the kitchen, and I thought, I, I can't just leave him run this on his own. And the original head chef that I hired for Must, Andre Ma, who we should talk about uh, uh, in this segment, um, I kind of rang him and said, look, I'm having this operation. Um, I need a bit of help because I, I won't be – I couldn't even lift a knife. Um, would you – what are you up to? And Andre said, yeah, mate. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll come back and give you a hand. I'll do it for you. And and literally, he did it for me. Um, and Andre is at a stage of his life where he doesn't want to work crazy hours. He's he's done his time. He's 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 made his dues. But he is such a talented chef, and I'd still call him the best charcuterie in Australia. Um, so Andre came back um, as a basically as a casual for the whole year, right until we closed. And. And I had two um, Italians in the kitchen, who a, a couple who uh, Marco was out of the Michelin star restaurant. Um, you know, like the core team was just guns. I, I just had the gun team, and we're doing takeout. We're putting food into a box. It was it was fantastic. We're actually doing restaurant food in a box. Um, and I was kind of doing standing there doing a bit of pointing because I I couldn't even slice bread um, with the right shoulder done and. And the guys were really supportive of that. And they're going, don't lift that, don't do that, you know. Um, but I was in the kitchen with them every day and that, that's, that was part of the deal, um, was just being around because that's really important. And they, they got me through that and that was, that was incredible. And, and the fantastic thing about it was Andre, who I opened the business with, the, the wonderful bookend to the business closing was Andre was there at the end. I mean, 19 years later, and he was with me for 13 years to start with, and then Andre came back and and did did the job and came back and closed us with me as well. Nineteen years in, which was just one of the most amazing bookends you could ever have in business. Well, let's go back nineteen years to the very beginning and and why you um, started Must Bar and what it was like back then. Um, look, Perth, uh, Perth. Perth was a really interesting place. Um, I, I'd um, let's rewinding back before us. Um, I'd uh, I, I could probably rewind a couple of steps, um, but look, um, I, I'd I'd opened as head chef a place called Forty Four King Street in Perth in 1991, and um, I worked. Uh, Phil Sexton was one of the owners. And one of my business partners in Must, Gary Gazzatti, was one of Phil's partners in 44 King Street. So that's where the relationship goes. King Street became an iconic uh, place in Perth. It's no longer there. I think it's a fashion shop or something. But we, we opened this business, Phil opened this business in the west end of Perth, in the centre of the city, in a wasteland of – there was no food businesses there. There was nothing, literally nothing. And um, we created this – um, we set up a bakery in the business. I, I set up a bakery in there. We had this really vibrant menu. And it, to, to this day, it's still the hardest food business I've run because um, David Coomer was my first sous chef. Um, Kurt Sampson worked with us at, at, at 
um, at King Street. Um, they, they, you know, we've become lifelong friends. Steve Scafidi was one of the managers, and Steve is now at you know, State Buildings. Yeah, like it was like a who's who of like hospo crew coming through that business. It was a 110 seater. It was incredibly busy, and the menu was like a stopover of um, you, you could put a, any dish on the menu as long as it was consistent to that city in the world. So there'll be a um, you know there could be a char siu duck rice paper rolls or, or there could be a rice paper rolls. There could be a red braised ro- pork ribs um, next to, um, you know, a line court snapper with a, a fennel biscuit panzanella and aioli. So, so we try and keep the, the dish consistent with the country or the city that it's from. And that was six dishes a week changing, incredibly hard, but 10 years of, 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 of an incredible business. I eventually um, bought Phil Sexton out and became a partner in that business. And then um, I sold out, I think, in 1999. Um, then skip forward um, a couple of years, um, Gary rings me, Gary Gazzetti rings me and says, look, um, I've got a site in Highgate um, and do you want to come and meet with me and Anne-Marie Banting? Anne-Marie's got a really good idea for it. Um, sat down and Anne-Marie said, look, uh, I want to create um, Willie's Wine Bar in Paris, in Perth. Um, and look, all of my training back going in my past, all my traditional training as a chef was in French food. I mean, I, I worked at the Dorchester for a couple of years with Anton Mosiman, um, mm. worked up in the Terrace restaurant, one Michelin star. All we did was classic and modern French food, all that technique. And you know, if somebody asked me what was centre target for me then, it would be French. And when somebody comes and says, we want to open a French bistro, it was like, let me out of it. I'm, I'm in. I'm, I'm in. Um, Gary, had, Gary was an original partner in the Matilda Bay Brewing Company and he set up the uh, Queen's Hotel on Beaufort Street. And across the road, he'd seen this site many years before called Shambles, which was an old furniture store. And he thought, gee, that would, that would be a good site for a, he thought, a pizzeria at the time. Mm. Um, and then along comes the site up for sale, um, up for lease. And Gary, I think, spotted it. And Anne-Marie had the idea and um, they co-opted me to come in and become a business partner and set up, run the kitchen operation. And, um, you know, we had the name, uh, the name of the, the current building was shambles we thought we didn't we wouldn't call it that and so we thought you know must has that double meaning of you know unfamiliar the, the juice of, and skins and stalks of grapes uh, that's just been crushed mm. um so we did that and we launched must with a with a with the concept of must being this little bit of paris on Beaufort street um but being the place that you could drop into the bar have a drink um Amazing wine list, like or have something that was that you just gawk over. Just uh, an incredible wine list that Amory started writing, and then others followed. And I, I got to cook food that was, you know, like French bistro food that was really soul food for me. Stuff like, um, you know, um, you know, raw salmon with a fave, shaved fennel salad and dill and seed mustard dressing. This mm. is probably menus from um, early 2000s, let's be honest. Um, I'd, I'd do, um, you know, steak fritz uh, with a beautiful bearnaise. Um, we'd do a duck leg confit with, a, I think in, the, in those days, a Pedro Jimenez, Pedro Jimenez lacquered pork belly and autumn vegetable and lentil braise. Uh, Meredith goat cheese and vegetable terrine with walnuts and current vino cotto. So it, a little bit of a modern take on traditional French bistro. Um, and the core of that, the, the the first part of that had to be charcuterie. And I advertised for a head chef. And uh, this guy called Andre Ma, this chef called Andre Ma, um, who was born the same year as me, 1963, um, applied for it. And I looked at his CV and I went, what the, the – Andre trained uh, in his – he worked for his dad. His dad's a charcuterie. He worked in his dad's charcuterie shop, went to Paris from from the top of France, went down to Paris and uh, worked in charcuterie in, in Paris. And then he kind of trained as a chef as well and went into cooking. And Andre's sitting there, um, I think, in, in Cottesloe working in this place. And um, I, I, I think kind of 
his real resource wasn't being tapped as a as mm. a as a great charcuterie. And I kind of had this menu where I went, look, I've got a chicken liver parfait recipe from the Dorchester Hotel. Look, um, I'd love to do ham on pussy. I'd love to do, you know, a, a, a pate on crude. I'd love to, yeah. And he goes, yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> what do you want? Yeah. Dude, yeah. Easy, mate. Easy, mate. I can do it. So we put together this charcuterie plate. Um, Andre executed it perfectly. And that was the start of, that was the first item on the menu, mm. charcuterie. And, and we, uh, I reckon it was two years that we, we didn't sell it, didn't sell. <laughs> Nobody could pronounce it, shashish, shashish, um, uh, and, but, you know, when you know something's good, you just, you stick to your guns because it was, it was sensational charcuterie. It was stuff I'd only tasted in France. Um, and Andre was making it and we just, I just said to the guys, stick with it. And the reason I could stick with it, is because I had brilliant people on the floor because they would they would sell they would sell charcuterie they would talk it up they would go this if you have a glass of wine at the bar just get a charcuterie plate mm. because it'll work you know you can order any pretty well any glass of wine and have a charcuterie and they're always going to sing together they 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 work you know they're married they so you know you and then they started to you know pick wines that would go really well with charcuterie so you know it, it might be you know. Um, not you know high acid Rieslings or Pinot Blancs from Alsace or you know cool regions of France or, or you know even a Pinot Noir or a Vouvray you, you name it mm. um, it's just built for wine and you know the guys on the floor um, yeah Emma um, all the guys Lachlan Aaron James you know, Steph Zach that they just they just go out and go give it a go you'll love it and within two years we had created. A following for the charcuterie plate, amongst in amongst a bistro that was just booming, like the place was just rocking, absolutely rocking. We we were licensed for 174 people. Wow! And it was it kind of became party central. You know, any time after 10 o'clock on you know Friday and Saturday nights, it was it morphed into this beast um, that just became. Oh, just you know, the bar was deep with people, and it was just a party uh, f- for years and years and years. And it was such a fun place to work. Nineteen years is extraordinary for uh, any restaurant or bar uh, in the industry. What, what's been um, some of the highlights and over the years, and how much did the establishment change in that period of time? Um, look, one of the early highlights was we, we were the first non-smoking bar in WA. We set the business up as that right at day one. And, I mean, I'd experimented with, with it back in the King Street days and saw there wasn't kick – I mean, back in the King Street days, I'll never forget it. We had a guy who stubbed us – or a woman who stubbed a cigarette out on a guy's arm because he complained about smoking. And I'm lightly asthmatic and I hate going to a bar and – you're trying to have a really good glass of wine. And you've got someone's cigarette smoking wafting across you. So easy decision. We, we as a partnership group, we said, look, we're going to open as non-smoking. That's it. Boom, go outside. Um, and we did that, and that was a big highlight because that changed the venue for anyone who walked in. It was always cl- that clean air, which was really fresh. Um, the highlights. Look, we we won all these awards. Like all of that stuff was really good, and I. I I value the awards really highly, but also I value more for the fact that those people that worked there at those times could take them away. And, for example, Emma Farrelly was um, an an amazing person. I worked with a lot of amazing people, but Emma, um, she worked with me for, it would have been six years, I think. And uh, Paul McArdle worked with Emma very closely on the wine list. Paul kind of flew over the top of it. Um, and was my wine consultant, and Emma worked as restaurant manager and som in the business. And um, we were picking up these wine awards year on year at year out for for the wine lists. Um, and then I think in two thousand and nine we got, well, I think we might have got some early, but in two thousand nine we got a three goblet award wine list of the year in Western Australia. Um, so, and I had this, I never ever put awards up on the wall of the business. There was not one award up on the wall of the business. They're all in a store cupboard at the back. And literally, I'm, so, I'm sorry, but there was just 
piles of these things out of the bag. And when we when we closed, and Emma was coming in for dinner in December last year, I kind of went through and I looked at, I look, you know, when was Emma? Oh, actually, Emma was here in two thousand nine, and we got three goblets then. So I could, I gave Emma that award, and she cried, and it was like, wow, th- that value of that award to Emma is just unspeakable. It's so good that she could take that away and that's hers for life. Um, so, and, and they're, they're the things that mean so much to me and, and so many other songs like Stefano, I did the same thing with Aaron Commons. I did the same thing with as well because they, they had patches of time who, who were the, integral to the business and running the business that they, they they basically won those awards for the business and were clearly a part of it. And, and you know, my job with those people was really just getting a great crew into the business and finding out what they needed in their life, what was, what was important to them, and then making that happen, making that happen for them. It was, it was, yeah, that was my role. It was just kind of, kind of driving the train. But the the train, um, you know, one man can't really start or stop a train. It's it's a bunch of people, you know, shoving the coal and and um, watching the points and all that kind of stuff that make that happen. Um, that was that was so big. Those awards were great, and being able to give them to people who who they meant so much to was, I think, a really really good experience for me. So so. If I if I rewind back a bit, because you you know I mentioned to you how how you know, Anne Marie and Gary approached me and 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 said, look, we're going to open this French wine bar. Uh, there there was a defining moment, a lot earlier in my life, uh, that that kind of defined the yes that I said when they offered me that, and that was um, in 1984. I went to France. I was I was part of the Australian team, a, a culinary team that went to the Culinary Olympics in, in Frankfurt and fantastic experience. And I thought, look, um, I'll use that opportunity to have a bit of a travel through France. Um, Bill Panel, who owns Mosswood, who was a family friend, um, said, look, I'll, I've, I've got these friends I know in, in Burgundy and you can go and stay with them for a couple of nights or whatever. Um, so he organised that. We went down to Burgundy and stayed with um, Becky Wasserman. And I didn't know it then, but Becky Wasserman is one of the greatest living importers of Burgundy into America. Um, but to me, she was this American lady who's very kind and lovely um, and uh, who I cooked a dinner for over this wood fire in a 300-year-old barn that we stayed in for that night. Um, the next morning, Becky and her son said, come upstairs, we're having a bit of a tasting. And they had uh, these bottles laid out on a map of the Cote de Bone. And we tasted some of these wines that were up and down the map of the Cote de Bone, which is a pretty small area. It's not that huge. And these wines were just so incredibly different, um, elegant, you know, truly amazing f- finessed, you know, the higher up the coat you went. And as the, the, the wines from the, the, the base, the base of the coat were, you know, a little bit more robust, more, you know, village or just Van Ordinaire wines, but all made from a Pinot Noir. Um, and there was incredible variation in the flavours of these wines, the, the, the weight, the texture, the tannins, you name it. They, they were in, just incredibly so much different. Um, so, um, Becky's son got us in the 2CV, my sister was with us, we drove to every vineyard and what I couldn't believe was that these vineyards were within a couple of hundred metres of each other and we're, tra- we're tasting wines that were so different, that were so varied from elegant, feminine and beautiful down to robust and, and you know, full-bodied and they were literally, some of them were, were within a stone's throw of each other. And that was my first lesson in terroir um, when it came to wine. And that, that led to a, a long-standing passion for wine for me. But then back in the TCV, up to Dijon, sat us down in a, a brasserie on a corner, um, drinking the same wines and eating charcuterie. And that was the defining moment. I was going to open one of these places sometime in my life 
um, whenever the opportunity came up, and the opportunity did, and that that was it for me. Well, 19 years is extraordinary, and there aren't many people that have visited WA and um, not gone to your establishment, and same with the residents of WA that love good food and wine. Tell us about the decision to close the restaurant and what sort of impact it had on you. Well, look, look, the decision was pretty easy um, because it's a choice and the choice was um, sign up for another 10 years of lease um, with with the incredible uncertainty of the COVID year um, or go and do something else. And that, that, I think COVID made that really, the decision really easy because when you, when you commit to a 10-year lease, you're paying that lease. You, you, you don't get out of it. it it's, there. it's there. It's there for the 10 years and you're committed to 10 years of, of those costs. And you know, we're, in a, we're in a COVID year, um, incredibly uncertain. How long is this going to go for? Is it going to go for 12 months? Is it going to go for two years? Is it going to be – what's going to happen? Um, it, the decision is easy. Let's, let's, um, let's get to the end of the lease. Um, let's shut up shop and then move on and do something else. And so that, that, that wasn't a difficult decision. Um, and, you know, after, I think after 19 years of being in business in one place, that made it easier to say, yeah, look, that, let's, it's time. It's time. Um, <clears throat> because you go through so many ups and downs in business um, that uh, you, you kind of think, really, um, if you wanted, if we wanted to do, to do something with Must for the next ten years, I, you, you'd probably have to. I, I think you'd probably have to really re, reinvent the place again. Because um, <clears throat> from two thousand and one to two thousand nineteen, we we really never deviated off the core. Um, kind of idea of must, which was a Parisian bistro, um, a great place that you could drop in or have a big event um, in the heart of Beaufort Street. And and I, I think other people say it, 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 it became an icon and, and it, look, it, it became iconic in terms of when people were reflecting to me what it meant to them. And, um, but, you know, you in business, you can't really get sentimental because if you've had a good innings, um, it comes down to the indecision, uh, that, that um, uncertainty around the year we were in and, and just really not wanting to commit to another 10. And that's given me the opportunity to review my entire life um, over the last 103 days <laughs> um, <laughs> to get out and consult and refresh and – um, work out what I want to do next, and and you know I'm not there yet, but but um, the consulting's been really rewarding, and the opportunities are pretty great um, and big, and they look like fun and probably huge challenge because you know Western Australia is in this incredible, in, and, and I think the whole of Australia is, but Western Australia is in this incredibly difficult position of. Hospitality businesses are in so busy, um, and we can't staff them. They're in, they're in, mm. They were just not the staff to to man them, and that just creates so many difficulties. So I think I think the next ten years for me will be working out how we make a model, a hospitality model that is innovative and attractive to people who work in the game. And that's probably what I'm going to be doing yeah, for quite a long time. Um, it, it, I think we have to innovate. We have to come up with new ideas. We have to att attract staff in a different way. We have to make hospitality a better place to work. I, I, that's really important. It's got to be people first. Um, and that will drive the successful businesses of the future in WA. You mentioned that the last 19 years that – uh, there was a lot of problem solving and you're always able to be in control of any sort of issues that you were uh, confronted with, but the pandemic was different. Has, it, has there been lessons learnt in the last year as an operator that you'll transfer to something you may do in the future? Uh, yeah, don't make, don't make thing, things too complicated. <clears throat> don't over-design don't, uh, over businesses. Don't decomplex them, make them simpler. Um, 
you don't run with anything extra that you don't need. I mean, I, I, I had in, in 2012, I had 500 wines on the list. Um, in 2020, I wrote the list myself and it was back in front of an A4 sheet. And I, I thought it was still just as exciting, um, probably not as, exci- as, as exciting as a 501 list, especially when you know guys like Paul and Emma and, and Steph and Aaron wrote them. Um, but 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 de- decomplex it. Like you've got to make business less complex. You, I think you have to make food less complex um, because if you if you've got um, limited manpower. You've got to you've got to have the one two three principle, you know, core, uh, another component, and then a finish. You know, I think times are changing where you've you've got to use great produce, uh, and I, I think produce will probably be the thing that will even. I've always been a champion, you know, of West Australian produce. It's just it's the DNA. I'm a farm boy, you know. Um, we had the whole farming background means that if you drink milk from a cow when it's fresh out of a cow, it tastes better than stuff in a bottle, you know. So so putting produce first and when you highlight produce, really good produce, simply the work is mainly done, you know. Um, I, that sort of stuff um, is is just critically important to, to, to treat food simply but respect um, produce and, and I think this the innovation that we're going to be seeing in the next few years in hospitality in WA is going to be pretty different. I, I went down um, last week to the Great Southern. I do I do I've done a lot of festivals in the past, and it was a great opportunity to catch up with one of um, uh, the, the you know, core crew of Must, which is Amy Hamilton, who's got Liberté down in Al- Albany, and just a total legend. She, she, I mean, Amy's a savant when it comes to putting ingredients together. I, I can't believe what Amy does. S- seriously. It, she, she gets local produce down in the Great Southern and will combine local crab and then some local mushrooms and, and some noodles and wrap them in a rice paper wrapper and crumb and deep fry it, and it tastes like heaven you know and and she's she's constantly come up with these incredible um dishes out of local produce she's a truly amazing but yeah so down in the great southern um i i i when i do those events i ask people and people for give me an ingredient list what can you get and i was doing an event at orange tractor and it's an organic vineyard he's got lots of mates doing organic stuff and he said look i've got a mate who's picking prickly pears and um, can you do something with that? I said, bring them on. I've never used prickly pears before. Give it a go. Um, and these things, you can't touch them. <laughs> um, I found out that you, you've got to use a fork to poke your fork in and then flick the peel off with your knife. And it it just reveals this most amazing, incredibly coloured fruit that tastes a little bit like rock melon. Um, that's just amazing. I thought, this will make a great granita. So um, made that into a granita um, and then I've fermented some local cream with kefir, so a kefir cream that fermented and I made a panna cotta from that and just put a spoonful of this prickly pear granita on top. And I think it's the best dish I've done in years because it's just the simplest thing ever, using stuff that you've just found or just been brought to you that has integrity and it's local. And it's like, wow, gee, should do more of that <laughs> because it's just great food and and um, it was a bit of a highlight for me to to um, be able to serve something like that um, with the privilege of knowing that you know Murray's mates had gone and, and picked these prickly pears because you know you, I think you need welding gloves to get the things off um, but I, I think yeah look it, it's when when you think about kitchens. Um, I, I guess I, I, I've always run the business from the kitchen and, um, you know, Amy and Andre and guys like Chris Chong who worked with me in the early days and went down to run the Margaret River business when we ran that. There's a couple of other guys, Diego and George Cossio, two brothers who are incredible chefs who are in Melbourne now. Uh, Lisa Shrewstone, who, who's now got her own pastry business. And, you know, the, the sous chef that stayed with me through – you know, that last tough year and, and five years before that was Masato, Masato Hirai. And, you know, like 
when you when you work together in the environment that we work in, um, the team becomes this indelible band of brothers that um, that you never lose. You know that incredible respect for and i've seen that right through my business on both in the floor teams and in in kitchen teams how um they become it's it's more than an employee it's more than a workmate it's when i look at the the floor teams there's lifelong friendships there's there's um there's there's partnerships and and children out of floor teams from must um and the, the meaning of that to me, is more than any plate of food or any glass of wine that you can ever serve, because that those those friendships and those relationships are lifelong, and they they will forever kind of outlive the memory of Must Wine Bar, um, and and to me they're they're probably probably more important than anything we ever put in a plate or in a glass, um, and. You know, like you do all these things, um, but it's just so nice to have, you know, those relationships. Um, look, there's other stuff that I've done, and, and this is the other thing about Must. Must being such a busy place, it gave me opportunities to do so many other things. Um, and I, I – it was funny because – I had a business in Margaret River. We had must in Margaret River. And I had a staff member there, Joe, Joe Linus, who um, <clears throat> she had a chat to me one day and she said, Look, I, I do a bit of work for this charity called Surf Aid, blah, blah, blah. Um, and there's this guy coming to West Australia. His name's Dr. Dave, Dave Jenkins. And he, I reckon you should have a chat to him. I went there, yeah, okay. And because Joe knew I was a surfer. And um, I had a chat with Dave and that changed my life. Um, because he started this charity called Surf Aid where he uh, would go surfing on one of these remote islands in Indonesia. He'd, they'd go onto the beach and they'd see all these graves and they'd, he'd kind of say, what's all this? And they said, well, they're, they're kids, they're children. And he couldn't believe it and he's just going, why? And and it's funny that a lot of these kids, kids would die directly after childbirth or through malnutrition and all of these different reasons. And he, as a doctor, he kind of goes, these are simple things these kids are dying of. Um, you know, I'm going to do something about it. So he started Surf Aid and he he just started this organisation that just supported people, empowered them um, to um, – when the, you know, if they're feeding, they're having a little rice porridge, um, if they stirred these little green um, wild spinach into the rice porridge, it would give the child vitamin C and uh, help with help them avoid malnutrition. If they supplied mosquito nets, it would uh, cover them from getting mosquito bites um, and um, you, you know, dying from other dengue or, or other fevers they get. Um, teaching a woman... It, uh, Teaching a um, uh, someone who's helping a mother uh, birth a child, if you teach the midwife and say, look, if you wash your hands before you deliver this child, you will drop that mortality rate of those children by double-digit figures. So he's put these programs throughout Indonesia and they're just spreading throughout Indonesia inc- so incredibly well. And I just went, this is so simple. Um, it's not top heavy. All the money was going to the programs, and so I started this group of. I, I said to my mates down in Margaret, "Let's start this thing. We'll call it Surfing Chefs for Surf Aid." A bunch of surfing mates of mine down there. We started a charity event in Margaret of Business and raised a bit of money. It was great. Um, so we thought we've got something here, and Surf Aid thought the same. So we did. Um, we've done about. Eight of them so far, eight or nine. We've we've raised so far half a million dollars for Surf Aid, and the last couple were over with Darren at Three Blue Ducks in Byron. So we took it around Australia, and Darren just jumped on it like crazy, and his staff were just so on board with it, and we raised so much money in Byron, and, and Darren's now an ambassador, and, and it's you know that that's. That's because I had some time and ability to step out of the business occasionally and, and do other work, and it's incredibly rewarding. I've met 
so many fantastic chefs around Australia who I never realised served, um, who just really want to give back. The, 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 you know, it's probably pretty tough during these times to spend any time outside doing that work, but um, the generosity of our our crew, the generosity of everyone is just amazing. It's we've got. We've got ability and it's great to see so many people, so many cooks around Oz using that ability for good. It's been a um, crazy year and you've let go of uh, something that's been a big part of your life. But what sort of positives do you see uh, for the industry um, moving forward, coming out of this? Look, I, I see a lot of people in the industry having a life. Um, uh, so first of all, Internally, uh, people in the industry, they've decided, look, uh, whether they run on set menus, whether they run on less days a week, I think people have said, let's, we, let's run our business. We can make it profitable in you know, less shifts, less services a week, and we can have days off and we can have a life. Because hospitality, I think, pre-COVID was a lot about running a business, um, keeping it together, keeping it all afloat and just just keeping it together by threads. Now I think you can solidly stitch it together um, and by, by having that life, by having those days off, by being able to reflect, you actually go into your business much fresher and more creative and more vibrant and more energetic and the customers see it. And, and the other thing is the customers, I, I – honestly see our customers and I can speak for myself are so much more appreciative of what we do in our game and you know like having when you I'm assuming it's when they got it taken away from them they realized that oh actually I really do appreciate this I think I will be more uh patient I think I'll be more appreciative and uh, you know, I don't see so much you know online kind of derision um, I think I just see I think I think the world's changed in in customer perception of the value of hospitality to the world and I think that's such a good thing well Russell uh, it's amazing to um, hear your story and I feel like we could uh, probably record a couple of episodes. I feel like you've, you, I feel like you've got a lot more to say. Um, it's uh, what you've done with the uh, bus wine bar. Absolutely extraordinary and look forward to seeing what's to come as well. We've loved having you on deep in the weeds today and no doubt we're going to catch up again soon and have another chat. Thanks Anthony. It's been a real pleasure and thanks for asking me. This is the deep in the weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospital community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.